Okay, good evening and welcome to Questacon. Let, let's get the show on the road, as they say. I'm Graham Durant. I have the pleasure and privilege of being the director here, so I have the best job in the world sometimes. And um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Ngunnawal people and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders present and indeed any First Nations people present here tonight. So you're all very, very welcome. Um, Indigenous Australians looked into the night skies and they actually saw the space between the stars. You know, the Romans and other cultures saw the stars and made stories out of the patterns. Indigenous Australians made the stories out of the dark space in between. And you often wonder what they were thinking. So they were imagining in the spirit world and their minds were doing the exploring of space. And we don't know what they were wondering, what they were imagining. Tonight, we've got some real exploration involving people and technology. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear some of the stories. And, and I know the stories are very, very significant. And we're delighted to have two very senior figures join us from the States. And I'll let Glenn do the formal introductions. But welcome back to Suzanne and Larry. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Glenn. Get out of the way. Get the show going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, yes. Uh, good evening. It's really wonderful to be back here again at Questacon. We thank them so much again for their support for all the talks we have done here over many years, although there's that big gap from 2019 <laughs> onwards, a century ago, as it were. Uh, my name is uh, Glenn Nagel. I'm from the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager out there, along with my colleague, Dr. Dr. Corinne McDonnell. Uh, we'd like to just first off just thank uh, all of the people who have supported tonight, and you can see those mentioned on the screen here, of course, NASA and the Jet Propulsion Labs uh, for uh, having uh, our guests here this evening. Uh, the CSIRO, who's our parent organisation, uh, helping to manage the tracking station out at Tibbambilla on NASA's behalf, and of course the support from the US Embassy as well, and of course the wonderful contribution of Questacon of hosting uh, the location for us tonight. Um, yeah, I'd like to further also echo Graham's words about the Indigenous cultures. Uh, really, we need to further acknowledge uh, a culture and a people who have been you know, exploring the land and the sky and the waters for over 60,000 years. And it's that kind of exploration that Australians have been good at for millennia. And, of course, now in the local space age, over the last 60 years, through the Deep Space Network and tracking stations at Aurora Valley and Honeysuckle Creek, and we... Uh, quite honoured also have here tonight one of the former directors of the Honeysuckle Creek and at Tibbambilla, uh, Mike Dinner, who's here with us in the front row. Uh, people who were essential in the work that was done, particularly during the Apollo programs and those first wonderful images of Armstrong stepping onto the surface of the moon live through Honeysuckle Creek. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Suzanne Dodd, uh, who's going to be our first speaker tonight. Uh, you cannot really, and she'll get very embarrassed by that, she's a legend of space exploration, um, a, real, a real veteran of so many missions. Um, she has the best job title in the world next to Larry. She is the director of the Interplanetary Network Directorate. That's a question for you to all ask later. What is that job all about? But she has worked over the last 30 years on missions such as the Cassini mission, the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, the Nuclear Spectroscope, spectroscopic telescope, that was the one, <laughs> and, and of course the amazing Voyager missions and not only is she the current director for the Interplanetary Network Directorate, she's also the project, current project manager on the Voyager missions. So uh, please give a great Canberra welcome to our first speaker tonight, Suzanne Dodd. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I'm really, really pleased to be able to talk to you about uh, my best job. I think I have the best job, Graham, so. Uh, and and it's, it's twofold, as uh, Glenn introduced. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about the Voyager project, but I'm also gonna talk to you about the Deep Space Network and how those two programs have really grown up together. Okay. 
All right, so uh, the lights are dim, but I'm going to say that most of you, when I was watching, well, maybe half and half of the people in here are either uh, under 45 or over 45. And if you're under 45, you were born after the Voyager missions launched. These two spacecraft, these incredible spacecraft, launched in 1977. So there's 70s technology, and um, they are still operating today. They are the uh, furthest out missions from us, now both of them in interstellar space, and also the longest operating missions that humankind has, has made. And uh, just a little quick little fact about 1977, the number one hit song when these spacecraft were launched was by a little known Australian group called the Bee Gees, How Deep Is Your Love? And we sent the Voyagers off with that playing in the background. So uh, Voyagers were originally a four-year mission, okay? Uh, two spacecraft identical going to Jupiter and then to Saturn. Now, um, the launch in 1977 was key because in, in that year, the alignment of the four outer, uh, giant outer planets, being Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, were all in the same direction from the sun. So we could send one spacecraft and we could hit all four of those because they were all on the same side of the sun. And um, that's exactly what we were able to do with Voyager 2, because after Voyager 2 went past uh, Saturn, it went on to Uranus and then on to Neptune. And since the Neptune encounter in 1990, it's traveled 32 more years into interstellar space. And I'll talk a little bit about that and what that means. But these are really incredible spacecraft, very robust, amazing that they're still operating. You think of that, 45 years, the, the anniversary is this August, the launch anniversary, from a four-year mission. Now, that's what, that's what you call an extended mission. OK, well, what are the Voyagers doing now? The Voyagers are, are now uh, doing science on the sun, on our heliosphere, and also since they've crossed what we call the heliopause, which is the edge of the, the bubble around our sun where the charged particles from the sun stop, Voyager's gone through that bubble, and it's in what, what scientists call the local interstellar media. So Voyager has gone from a planetary mission to a heliophysics mission, and now it's almost an astrophysics mission. I mean, it's, it's looking at and studying the, the data that's in between stars just like the uh, original people here in Australia, which I just learned that fact tonight, so that was great. Um, so, but what are the big questions we're trying to answer with regard to the heliosphere is what is its shape? Is it, is it round? Is it more comet shape? Or it could, there are some theories that say it's even a croissant shape. You know, what, are the, what is the density of the plasma? How does that change as you get further away from the sun? And we use Voyager as the only in situ spacecraft in interstellar space. What that means is they're there. They're sensing interstellar space. We have a lot of other missions that study the heliosphere and study the sun, but they're all real close to us. And when we're, the, we're the two spacecraft that are way, way far away, and you can use our data to match up with the models and the data from the, the spacecraft that are much closer to create a much better understanding of how our star was formed, how it interacts with interstellar space, how the magnetic field interacts with interstellar space. So we're really contributing a lot of valuable data. And the longer that we can keep these missions operating, the more unique the data is because it's so far out. And it's going to take us decades to get a mission out as far as the Voyagers are right now. So on the Voyager spacecraft, uh, there are two, two identical spacecraft. Voyager 2 has five instruments operating. Voyager 1 has four instruments operating. And, and over time, we try to balance the, um, we, I was going to say, the, the power source for Voyager is not solar arrays. You know, the, the sun looks like a tiny little star from where Voyager is. So we use uh, radioisotope thermal electric generators. It's basically nuclear power. And it loses four watts of power a year. Our mission has lasted so long that we're really down there making the tough decisions now about what to, 
what to turn off to keep the spacecraft operating longer. And we've turned off all of the heaters on the instruments. So the, the instruments are, are extremely cold, but they're still operating. Never in the lifetime of those 45 years have we turned off the heaters before. And we have in the last couple years, and the instruments are still operating. Again, truly, truly amazing. So um, operations, as I mentioned, is, is, it's complicated because of the distances. Um, Voyager 2 is the closer spacecraft to us. It's not traveling quite as fast. But still, uh, it's, it's one-way light time. The time it takes a signal from the, from the deep space network to get to the spacecraft is close to 20 hours. That's, that's one way. And then it's 20 hours back to talk to the Earth. So, so everything is kind of in slow motion when you're talking about commanding the spacecraft and finding out what's going on with it. And the data rates are very, very low, 160 bits per second. It's just barely a trickle of science data that comes back. But it's all very valuable science data. But the, the spacecraft are kind of out there on their own. They have to be very autonomous. They have to be able to fix. Um, if something goes wrong, they have to be able to sort of fix themselves. And that's kind of our key strategy, is not to do a lot with these spacecraft, not to command a lot, but just let them take data. And they are constantly sending data down to us on Earth. We capture that data whenever we have an antenna that's listening. The, and the antennas aren't always listening, but when we do, that's when we capture the data. And uh, speaking of capturing data, you can imagine that the people that design these spacecraft, if they've been flying for 45 years, it means they, they are at least, uh, let's say, 70 to 80 years old. So the knowledge capture of how the spacecraft was designed and um, you know, trying to fix things that, that, that get out of whack, is, it's difficult because um, the people that know how to do it, some of them don't, are no longer with us. So it's, it's a great engineering challenge, and, and you're really trying to engineer something that you can't see, you can't touch. You don't really have a documentation on them. You don't really know, um, you know what, the, what was in the mind of the developer when they designed the software this way. So it's, it's really an, uh, fixing anything on Voyager is a little bit of archaeology and a lot of uh, good engineering. Um, I think, uh, again, we're losing four watts of power a year. We, we're also very cold out there in space. And, and to point the antenna at the Earth, it takes, um, we use hydrogen propulsion system, little thrusters, and they keep that antenna pointed at the Earth so we can get the data back. That hydrogen can freeze. And if it, if it freezes, then we'll slowly drift off and lose the signal and lose the spacecraft. So we have to keep the spacecraft warm enough so that the hydrogen doesn't freeze. And you can, but it's a balance between the power that that takes. So you could imagine uh, you would turn something off to save the power, but that could also freeze the, the lines, which we don't want to have happen. So it's a, real, it's a real balance between power and thermal. And we do creative things, for example, on um, Voyager 2, we no longer operate our digital tape recorder. It still operates on Voyager 1. But we never turned it off because it's a good heater. It's in a, it's in a good location that can heat those propellant lines. So we never turned it all the way off. So it's those, those kind of trades we're, we make all the time. And, and um, those trades are getting more and more important as we try to continue to keep the spacecraft going. Um, Again, these are some facts about Voyager. Uh, Voyager 1 is the fastest spacecraft. It, it's it's uh, trajectory and, and speed when it left the last planet was more than Voyager 2. So Voyager 2 will never, in distance-wise, catch up with Voyager 1. But Voyager 2 was launched first. The naming convention has to do with the, with the spacecraft that got to Jupiter first. Um, and um, this is my only picture here of the golden record, but I think uh, this is the record that Carl Sagan designed with some grad students. It got put on very late, like, like six months before launch. They got permission to do this. Um, Carl Sagan went around the university, uh, uh, Cornell University, to find graduate students who could speak different languages and, and welcome people with greetings from Earth. And it's, it's just iconic to this mission, this golden record. And I think it gives humanity a sense of 
of, of, of feeling more connected to, to space and to our universe because there's something that we put together that represents the Earth that is going to circle around the center of the galaxy long after the Earth is gone and long after we're gone. And where's Voyager going? It's going out there. Uh, it's, uh, this is a map of the trajectories. Um, it shows you when it crossed the, uh, the uh, heliopause. That's the difference between the, the, the local interstellar medium, and this picture is in the blue, and the heliopause is in the orange. So, but Voyager 1 crossed the heliopause 10 years ago. It would be 10 years ago in August. So it's been traveling in interstellar space for 10 years, and Voyager 2 uh, crossed in 2018. And I mentioned the whole trades between um, power and thermal and how we are really hoping that we can be very creative and the spacecraft will be robust enough that we can operate this for at least its 50th anniversary, which would be five more years, but perhaps out to 200 AU, which would take us into the 2030s. Now, 200 AU is, is the distance, 200 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. So right now, voyagers are, are more than five times the distance between the Earth and Neptune. We're five times further out than that. So uh, hopefully in the Questacon, there's a model that shows these distances, and you can, you can go down there and, and measure them. So how do we talk to these great spacecraft that are so far away? Well, we use the Deep Space Network, which is, grew up essentially with Voyager in a lot of ways. The Deep Space Network complexes are uh, located in three sites around the world, uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, Canberra, out of here at Tittenbilla, and then in California, uh, out in the desert at Goldstone, California. And then the Mission Control Center for the Deep Space Network is at uh, JPL in Pasadena, California. So nearly all of the uh, science missions and deep space science missions uh, send their data back through the Deep Space Network. At, at least all of the NASA missions do, and we have several international missions that also use our facilities for their tracking. Um, we mentioned about the locations, but it's important to know that, that two are in the northern hemisphere and one is in the southern hemisphere, the one here. And uh, the connection with Voyager 2 is when Voyager 2 flew by Neptune, it went down and out of the plane of the planet. So Voyager 2 is essentially looking up at the Earth uh, when it communicates, and the only, space, the only site it can see is in the Southern Hemisphere, which is the Australian site here. So, so Voyager 2 has a unique connection to the uh, Deep Space Network here because it's the only one that it can, it can see and talk to. Um, not sure if I press this. Uh, we also do, okay, we'll, we'll just keep going. Well, um, we've, we've, we've been in a process of building new antennas. Uh, Australia actually got the first two uh, five or six years ago. We have just finished two new antennas in Madrid, Spain, during COVID, which was quite a feat in itself. But the first one was opened um, last year in 2021, and then we just had one open in uh, 2022, where the king of Spain came for the opening ceremony. Uh, they're brand new, shiny, 34-meter dish antennas. Um, so each, each of those three complexes, uh, over the course of about five more years, will have four 34-meter antennas and one 70-meter antenna. And the 70-meters the are the really big ones. I don't know how many people have been out to uh, Canberra. Has anybody been out to see the antennas out there? Oh, Glenn, you're doing a good job. Lots, lots of them. Yeah, good. So the big one that you can see from the visitor center is the 70-meter antenna, and further in the distance are the 34-meter antennas. But for a mission like Voyager that's so far out, we have to array all those antennas together to get the data down. And, and what that means is all the antennas point at the spacecraft, and the signals come in the individual antennas, and then they get um, spliced together, essentially, or, or, or the signal gets put together uh, so that we can get enough signal to, to get the science data out of it. So that's one of the reasons it's important to have multiple, uh, multiple antennas at a station. And we're building a new one currently out in the desert in uh, Goldstone, California. And these beam waveguides actually are big construction projects 
Um, the, the technique in this case is to dig a large hole and build a pedestal, a ramp down into the hole and a pedestal, and all the fancy electronics go into that hole. And then on top of that is where you put the antenna. Um, so this will be a new one in uh, opening in about another year. And then in two to four more years, we should get the, the, the newest, the latest one here built in Australia. So we're, we're building more antennas because we have more missions. Uh, and your, the next speaker, uh, Dr. James, Larry James, will, will talk about all the missions we have coming. I'm stuck. Is it changing? No. Oh, oh, hopefully it didn't change too far. So, um, and then some of the, besides building additional antennas, uh, we, we're looking at technologies, software technologies, where we can um, capture multiple spacecraft with one antenna. Around Mars, we can point one antenna at Mars and get back the signal from four different spacecraft that they're on slightly different frequencies. Um, and we're, we're also, uh, looking at moving to higher frequencies with our spacecraft, KA band, and even optical. And we have a deep space optical uh, demonstration mission that's coming up. This middle picture on the uh, right-hand side of the screen is uh, our, our demonstration uh, detectors for optical communication. And uh, the goal is, uh, once we are able to prove that demonstration, then what we'll have is we'll have a big 34 meter antenna and in the center of it will be optical detectors and the outside will be RF. We call this a, R, a radio frequency optical combination antenna. And that's, where, that's where we're heading. The, the, high, the KA band and the optical allow you to bring back more data with, uh, in a quicker amount of time. So I think with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you very much, Sue. That was fantastic. Uh, there will be, obviously, a chance uh, after both speakers have spoken to uh, do a Q&A session. Uh, so our next speaker this evening... Um, started at the Jet Propulsion Labs back in 2013 as the Deputy Director of the lab and also as its Chief Operating Officer, uh, responsible for all the interplanetary missions, uh, missions to Mars, all the solar system exploration, uh, and, of course, also managing 6,000 know, 6, people who work at the lab today, a lot of them from home at the moment, but lots of people there. Um, all that responsibility is a really good reason why he's come to the other side of the planet to get away from all of that, just for a short while at least, just to take that responsibility off, although I've been watching him all day on his phone answering messages all day. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to uh, invite uh, the gentleman who is currently acting, or is the interim, we call it acting here in Australia, the acting or interim director of the Jet Propulsion Labs, Larry James. Well, thank you, Glenn, and uh, thank you, Graham, uh, for again hosting us here at Questacon. It's always a joy for us to be here and really share with all of you what is going on really in space writ large in terms of exploration and science. Um, the missions we do at JPL are really all about understanding our planet, Earth, understanding our solar system, as uh, Susie talked about, and also understanding beyond our solar system. And so, you know, doing things that have never been done uh, requires a lot of great people who have uh, great thoughts and think outside the box. And really the first thing I want to do is show you a little video because I think it really captures the spirit of JPL and in many ways the spirit of NASA and the spirit of all those who really want to go out and explore. And it's really told from the voices of the people that work at JPL. So it's a, it's a short video, it's about three minutes, but I just want to give you a sense of what we really think about and how we think at JPL. So we'll run the video and then I'll come back up. What does JPL do? It's the most unique place to work on Earth. 
her charter is to do things no one has done before. We do what no one else even does to dream about. Imagination and innovation are crucial in being able to do the kind of work that we do. Innovation comes from people, but it also, I think, comes from structure and from the environment. If you can provide people with the appropriate tools, the appropriate workspace, the appropriate environments, you're also going to get a higher innovation output. One of the things that makes the JPL environment so special to work in is that even when you first walk on lab, it feels like a campus. And you walk around, you hear people talking about their work. What would be the best way to get a subsurface vehicle beneath the ice of Europa? And you're thinking, those people aren't just talking about it because they saw it on a movie somewhere. It's because they're really trying to figure out how to do it. JPL is an incredibly diverse place. There's thousands of people here with big brains. Planetary science, answering these big questions. You need chemists, physicists, astrophysicists, biologists, and then you need everyone on the engineering side to actually build the things that you need to answer the questions. People know so much about so many different things that if I'm looking for an expert in a particular field, engineering or, or science related, I can probably find them at JPL. I don't have to pick up the phone, I just have to walk down the hallway. Science is all about asking questions, and engineering is all about finding solutions. And so it makes sense to marry these two things together and try and answer the biggest, toughest, most difficult questions we can come up with. What does JPL do? JPL builds the tools for exploring space. The boldness of my colleagues is inspirational. The scope of the questions that they want to answer and the courage with which they go about tackling these big questions. The passion of the people to drive, the enthusiasm, and just the intelligence, the intellect that people throw every day at every problem that comes across. Given a, a very challenging problem, please do this thing that's never been done before that we don't know what to expect, that there's a huge uncertainty involved with. Most people would be terrified by that problem. I think those are the problems that we salivate over. We shouldn't do something because it's safe and easy. We shouldn't do the thing that everybody knows how to do. We should push the boundary, and even if that means we might fail, we might succeed too. I've never met anybody here that says, well, it's too hard. We all sit down and we have just start crunching the numbers and figuring out how to get it done. It's a journey. It's not necessarily an end destination. It's the whole way in which you're getting there. It's a very liberating kind of environment to be in because you don't have to be so afraid of mistakes. To recognize that we're doing science inside the solar system, outside the solar system, science focused back on Earth, our missions have a goal of helping humans understand more about the universe, and I think that's pretty amazing. JPL has enormous respect for a good idea, and if you have a good idea, this is the place to bring it to fruition. JPL is a special place because it allows people to have careers that are only limited by their imagination. Well, there certainly is this drive, I think, from the human race to go explore, and not everybody is involved directly with that effort. As the years go by when you're at JPL, it becomes very clear that it truly is a privilege to be here. This lab is leaving a legacy for not just the country, but for the world. And someday, if we ever do find that exoplanet that has life on it, or encounter some other solar system outside of ours, this is a place that's going to do that. So again, I just wanted to give you a sense of we're about, we're about the science. What we think about is, as they said, those hard science questions. You know, what's going on with our planet? What's going on with the solar system? How was the solar system created? Is there life outside the solar system? Is there life that perhaps happened inside the solar system? So a little bit of history, you know, where did JPL come from? We actually started with a bunch of Caltech students and professors trying to figure out how to build rockets in 1936. And they were doing that on campus in Pasadena uh, with the labs there. The only problem was they kept blowing things up and blowing windows out and doors and things like that. So the administration at the time said, please move. And so they moved up into this canyon near the San Gabriel Mountains. And you can see that picture there on the left. 
what we call the suicide squad. This is their little test stand trying to test rockets and figuring out how to build rockets. And so that was really our heritage and we became very good at building rockets up into the 1940s when World War II occurred and the Army took us over. So we became an Army organization responsible for building rockets to support the war effort. So they built facilities and they built aerodynamic tunnels and those sorts of things. And after the war, they reverted the lab back to Caltech. So then we started to think about, well, we build rockets. Can we do something with those rockets? Could we possibly put something on top of the rockets? And so ultimately, after Sputnik was launched, we built America's first satellite, Explorer 1. And we launched it in uh, January of 1958. And this was before NASA was even formed. So you see that iconic picture there in, in the top uh, right, which is on the left, Dr. William Pickering, the first director of the lab, who happens to be a native of New Zealand. They're very proud of that. Um, and then in the middle is Dr. James Van Allen. Anybody know what he discovered? Van Allen, Van Allen belts, yes. Uh, we had little instruments on Explorer 1, which actually discovered the Van Allen belts, which protect the Earth from cosmic and solar radiation. And then on the right is Werner von Braun, who helped build the rocket that got us into space. So, uh, again, uh, just a very great moment in the history of JPL. And a few months after we launched that satellite, the U.S. government created NASA. And NASA asked Caltech if they would be their research lab. So essentially that's what we do. We're, I'm a Caltech employee, Sue's is a Caltech employee, but we're under contract to NASA to do their deep space research and robotic exploration. So that's how we operate. And of course, uh, you see the little satellite there. I think we've heard about that one somewhere. Um, but as I said, when you think about JPL, you often think about Mars and Jupiter and doing cool things like that. But a lot of our mission is focused on the Earth. So we have multiple spacecraft that are looking back at our Earth, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. We also look out at Mars is very important because it's the planet that is most like the Earth, and we found it's had water and those sorts of things in the past. We look throughout the solar system, and we look beyond the solar system. So that's kind of what we focus on, and as you saw in the video, it's about, you know, what are the next science questions that we want to answer? You know, when we sent the rovers to Mars, the question was, was there ever water there? Well, we've answered that question. And so now the next question is, well, could that have supported life and could there have been life there? So I'll talk a little bit about how we're getting to that next set of questions. So this is just kind of all the missions we have ongoing today. Susie talked about the Deep Space Network. That's what the Deep Space Network does. It brings in the data from all of these missions so the scientists can ultimately do what they want to do in terms of understanding the data, understanding the environment, and really help us better understand our planet and the solar system. So I'm not going to walk through all of these, of course, but of course the iconic one, Voyager. We've been around Mars. I'll talk about that uh, for decades, doing missions there. We have spacecraft that are looking for objects that may hit the Earth, near-Earth objects. Uh, you saw in the video the Juno spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter. So a whole host of missions here that, that we have to uh, make sure the data is coming back to the Earth. We also have a lot of instruments um, that are flying either on other spacecraft or on the space station. One that I like to highlight just because I think it's pretty cool, literally. Uh, this is the Cold Atom Lab that's currently flying on the space station. It's literally pretty much the coldest place in the universe. We use lasers to cool down atoms to near absolute zero. And when you do that, you start to form this unique form of matter called Bose-Einstein condensate. And so it has very many unique properties. We have three Nobel Prize winners who are principal investigators with that experiment. And ultimately, it allows us to better understand matter, but also it gives us tools in the future to create these incredible instruments that can do measurement at a very quantum level. So uh, it's just amazing fundamental physics as well as doing all kinds of missions throughout the solar system as well as looking back at the Earth. So let's start with the Earth. So I'm just going to highlight a few of our missions and talk about them, not necessarily all of them in terms of our Earth-borne missions, but GRACE is a mission that measures gravity and changes in gravity of the Earth. We think gravity doesn't change on the Earth. Well, it, it actually does, number one. And number two, what, what really we're measuring is change in mass. So when these satellites fly over the Earth, um, they're looking at, what is the current mass and has it changed? So 
An example would be flying over Greenland over many, many months and years. And guess what's happening to Greenland? The ice sheets are melting. So when the ice sheets melt, there's less mass. And so literally by measuring that change, these spacecraft can tell you what's happening to the ice sheets of Greenland based on a change in mass or a change in gravity. And I'm going to give you a science lesson tonight, and I'm going to tell you how these spacecraft do that. So there's two spacecraft, and they're flying in formation uh, several hundred kilometers apart, and they have a microwave signal and a laser signal that goes between the two spacecraft and measures the distance between the two spacecraft. So, okay, so well, what does that do? Well, we measure it very precisely, down to essentially nanometers. And what happens is they're flying in formation, the lead spacecraft, as it approaches any point on the Earth, if there's more mass there, it literally will speed up a little bit because the mass is pulling it forward. While the trailing spacecraft has not yet reached that point, here's an example, it sees the mountain, speeds up. So the distance changes between the two spacecraft and as the trailing spacecraft passes over that mass, it catches up. So this is continuously happening as those spacecraft orbit the Earth. They're constantly changing the distance between the two of them based upon the mass that they are flying over. And so the scientists can then take that information, plug it into their models and tell you kind of what's the mass that they're flying over, and then we can look at what was that mass a month ago, two months ago, six months ago. We've actually been flying these systems now for probably 15 years. We launched, we had a first initial system, operated for about 12 years, ultimately it died, and then we launched replacement satellites called GRACE follow-on, and they've been operating about three years now. And so we're trying to maintain this continuous record of mass change throughout the entire Earth, which allows us to really understand, for example, as I said, what's going on in Greenland and Antarctica. So if you look here, you see uh, our baseline in 2002, what was the mass, you know, there. And as we go through time, you can see that in gigatons, Greenland has lost almost 5,000 gigatons of ice. Uh, since 2002 in the Antarctic, about 2,500 gigatons of ice. So that really helps our scientists understand on a broad Earth scale what's happening. Uh, another great example for us in California is we have aquifers that the farmers pump water out of. And you can't really see the aquifers. They're well underground. It's very difficult to drill down and understand what the water content is. But because if the water is disappearing or being used, there's less, wa <clears throat> less water, less mass. And so we've literally been able to measure the change in the aquifers in California and tell the government how much water has been depleted just based on changes in gravity or changes in mass. So that's one of the missions we're currently flying. Uh, this is another mission which is very important uh, in Australia and Africa, really everywhere, and it's a mission that measures moisture of the soil. We do that by using what we call radiometers as well as radar uh, to understand when it rains, there's a lot more moisture. Uh, over time, that moisture comes out of the soil. But that moisture is very important for the water cycle of the Earth. Obviously, it's very important for agriculture. So having those maps of global moisture, soil moisture, have really given our scientists as well as, you know, frankly, planners a better understanding of how all this transpires in terms of influencing the water cycle of the Earth. And here, you can actually, there's an app you can go on called Eyes on the Earth. You can download these maps, you know, on your iPhone and get a picture of what is going on with soil moisture. Um, this is a future mission uh, that will be launching this year in November called SWAT, which is Surface Water and Ocean Topography. Here we want to measure what's going on with the oceans and what, we, what is going on with our freshwater bodies, lakes, rivers, streams, and those sorts of things. This is a radar mission. It uses two radar beams which uh, hit upon the water and create what we call an interferometry pattern, and that allows us to measure the height of the ocean very accurately, the height of freshwater bodies very accurately, as well as measuring the currents. So again, the oceans are a big driver in terms of our climate. 
and we don't have the ability to really measure well, especially the currents throughout the ocean. You know, we have sauna buoys and those sorts of things that can do it very localized, but to have this global picture of ocean currents will be very useful for our Earth scientists to really, again, understand the water cycle, understand the impact on the atmosphere and climate. So we're very excited about this uh, mission that will launch, as I said, uh, later this year. This is a partnership with France. Uh, JPL built the radar payload. France is building what we call the satellite bus, which actually does the command and control and, and you know, keeps the satellite pointing in the right direction. It's currently in France, uh, getting tested with the, the payload and the satellite bus all together. It will be shipped back to the United States here in September. And then, as I said, we plan to launch it in November out of California. A couple of more examples of Earth science missions on the space station. I talked about CAL, Cold Atom Lab, which is really a fundamental physics mission. Uh, these are missions that are really focused on the Earth and helping us, as I said, understand the Earth. EcoStress is a very sensitive infrared instrument which measures plant health. And you say, well, how does it measure plant health? Well, healthy plants will bring water up out of the soil. That water goes into the leaves and it evaporates. And as something evaporates, it cools down. If there's not sufficient water or if they're in a drought, there's not enough water to go into the leaves, and so you don't get as much evaporation as the plant is less healthy. So literally what EcoStress is doing is just measuring the temperature of the plant. But a cooler plant is healthier because it's transpiring, and a warmer plant is less healthy. So we can get a nice picture of you know, crop health globally, and again, we can feed that information to the scientists and to the practitioners and help them understand how they're doing. Another kind of byproduct is because it's an infrared instrument that measures heat, we've been using it to measure the wildfires in California and help the firefighters understand where the fires are and how they might progress and those sorts of things. So that's been very valuable in California. And then OCO3 is Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3, placed on the space station. It flies in conjunction with a separate satellite called Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2. And so it gives us two spacecraft, one on the space station, one that's flying independently. They're looking at where is carbon dioxide being created? And as you all know, carbon dioxide is a key contributor to heating of the Earth and of the atmosphere. Uh, and also, where is it being absorbed? So we can look at, you know, for example, when they do a crop burning in Africa, it creates a lot of carbon dioxide, but you can also see where it's being absorbed, like in the Amazon uh, rainforest basin. So, again, helps the scientists to understand that carbon cycle in addition to, uh, for example, SMAP and the water cycle and eco-stress. So all these things come together to just give us a much better picture of our planet. CO2 measures every day the same time of day. With OCO3 on the space station, we're going to sample from sunlight to sundown. And so now we can learn about carbon cycle through different parts of the day. And that's really important because plants respond to sun, so we need to see them behaving across the day. What she said. <laughs> OK, uh, this is another future mission that is another radar satellite called NISAR the NASA ISRO, which is Indian Space Research Organization Synthetic Aperture Radar. This is a partnership with India. And again, very similar to our partnership with France, uh, JPL is building the instrument, the primary instrument, as well as the, the big radar reflector up here. And this is two bands of radar energy, S-band and L-band, which will, will beam down to the Earth, and it will reflect off the Earth, of course. But the intent here is to measure changes in the surface of the Earth. So we'll be looking at shorelines and coastlines. How are those changing over time? Uh, we'll be looking at biomass, for example, forests and those sorts of things. How is that changing over time? Uh, again, places like Greenland, just from a radar perspective versus a mass perspective that GRACE does, how is that changing over time? So it gives us this great snapshot of the entire Earth and the changes that are going on at a very fine scale again, to allow the scientists to understand and plug into their models and be better at predicting and sorting out what are the actions we need to take to continue to make sure our Earth is a great place. So that is, uh, we've got the, uh, the payload at JPL right now in our clean room. We'll complete all of our testing on that next year. We'll ship it off to India. They will then build, they're building the satellite bus right now. They'll integrate all of this together, test it all together, and then we are going to launch it from India on their GSLV, their Geosynchronous Space Launch Vehicle. 
So again, a tremendous partnership with the Indian uh, Space Research Organization. So we'll move from Earth, continue down the solar system path, and go out to Mars. As I said early on, I showed some all those missions we have. We've been operating about either around or on Mars for decades and continuously. So as I said, scientists want to learn a lot about Mars, so we've had multiple missions. Uh, we started out with our kind of our mid-sized rovers called Spirit and Opportunity. Opportunity uh, got way up north and it got too cold. And uh, you heard Susie talking about getting cold. Well, Mars gets pretty cold. And it's solar, we were stuck in a sand dune and its solar rays weren't oriented quite right toward the sun. So ultimately we lost power and we kind of froze to death. Uh, that's what Susie's trying to avoid on Voyager. But uh, space is not very forgiving. Um, but again, and then the second rover, uh, Opportunity, it basically lasted, I think, 12 years. And it's solar powered. And really what killed it was there was this incredible months-long dust storm on Mars. And the dust essentially blocked the sun from getting to the solar panels on the rover. And so the same thing happened. Ran out of power, couldn't keep the heaters on, ultimately froze, and it died. But just incredible science over a tremendous number of years in operations. Curiosity has been our workhorse of a rover on Mars, uh, landed now almost 10 years ago. I mean, it's got a long way to go to get to Voyager. But uh, August of 2012 was when we landed on the surface. And again, as I said earlier, you know, we didn't know if there was ever water on Mars before we really had these exploratory rover vehicles. But now we've shown that there is lakes and streams and groundwater that persisted for millions of years. There were, there's organic molecules there. So a host of new discoveries that Curiosity has done through the years. And I think this is just a great kind of video of the terrain that Curiosity has been operating in. You've got these huge sand dunes that we have to drive around, and the rover drivers really do an incredible job of just making sure we're safe and we get to where we want to go. And we also put missions on Mars that don't move. Uh, this is called InSight. This was a mission to really find out about the interior of Mars. We know a fair amount about the interior of our planet Earth, the core. It's a molten core and all those things. It's magnetic and so on. So we said, well, what's the core of Mars like? Because Mars does not have a magnetic field. So we wanted to sort out how do you figure that out. And the way we do that is we essentially put a seismometer on Mars. A seismometer on Earth measures earthquakes. A seismometer on Mars measures Mars quakes. And what the scientists do is anytime there's a quake on Mars, or even if a meteorite hits the surface and creates a seismic wave that goes through the planet, that gives them information about the interior of the planet because those waves are distorted as they go through the planet based on what's inside the planet. Is it soft? Is it hard? And so over time, based on multiple, multiple seismic waves that they measure, they start to build a picture of what the interior of Mars is like. And so you can see uh, already there's... Uh, results in terms of it's a much thinner crust than we expected. The core is kind of, it's not hard metal, it's kind of squishier than, but it's not molten like the Earth. There's been multiple papers published now that show what the interior of this planet is like. And we want to compare that to the Earth and understand why is it different and so on. So a very successful mission. Interestingly, we're also right in the middle of the atmosphere of Mars being much more opaque and we're losing power on our solar arrays right now. I just got an email uh, today that uh, we went into safe mode because the power level that we were receiving on the solar arrays had dropped to such a level that we couldn't keep all the instruments on. So the, the software says, OK, just go into safe mode, power down everything except the essentials, and then it'll phone home, if you will, and we'll ultimately tell it what to do. So the reality is that we're getting into this season where the atmosphere is going to become more opaque. The power levels are going to continue to drop, and so we actually expect this mission to not survive beyond the end of the year. But we've done all the primary science we want to do. We've got all the data, and now we're just kind of get more data. But again, a very successful mission to help us understand Mars. Um, one of the interesting things, people talk a lot about CubeSats, these small satellites, um, and there's a lot of them now in Earth orbit and those sorts of things. But when InSight was landing uh, back in 2018, our orbiting communication satellites around Mars weren't in a position to give us data 
as InSight was coming into the surface of Mars. And we like to have real-time data when that's happening. So uh, our smart engineers said, well, maybe we can build these small little CubeSat satellites that will act as radio relays, and we time it just right as InSight is landing on the surface, and they're in the, exactly the right position to receive the data from InSight and then beam it back to Earth. So they said, we said, okay, let's try it. So they literally built these two small CubeSats uh, here you see one of our uh, engineers uh, putting it all together. And essentially you have a receiver antenna down on the bottom of the CubeSat, and then it feeds the information up to this uh, reflector ray that's pointed toward the Earth and sends the data back to Earth in real time. And so both CubeSats survived. They both operated, and we've got the data back in real time as we were landing on Mars. So uh, really the first interplanetary CubeSats. And we kind of put a GoPro camera on this thing. You know, it was kind of cheap to build as much as we could, but it operated. So we had, you know, here it is coming into Mars. You can see the little dot. We're getting closer. Now you can see some great pictures of Mars <clears throat> as the spacecraft flew by. And these are, this is just that reflector ray antenna that I showed you just kind of in the background. So great success, interplanetary CubeSats, and you're going to see a lot more capability out of CubeSats in the future. And then we landed up and in fly February right of maneuver last year with where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds, and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom 9 and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Charge. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. They were happy. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of, it's a decade's worth of work to get to that point. Uh, so you heard them talking about terrain relative navigation. Uh, this is just some uh, happy snaps. Uh, 
And then we always want to take a picture right away when we land just to make sure we really did land and we're safe. So that was our first picture we got back from the uh, spacecraft. But essentially you've got this rocket system that the rover fits up underneath this until we start the sky crane maneuvers. You heard her talk about that, which is lowering the rover on these cables. Uh, but we talked about, you heard her talk about terrain relative navigation and doing the divert maneuver and those sorts of things. So Curiosity landed in a nice flat crater. Um, with Curiosity, we, we essentially come in ballistic and we don't have a lot of control over where we go. We have some with little jets that we fire as we're coming through the atmosphere, but not a lot of control. And so it, we picked a nice flat place to land for Curiosity. It landed safely, and then we continued our exploration. But of course, the scientists want to go to much more difficult terrain. And so the location for Perseverance was essentially a crater that used to be a lake that had a river running into it. And I'll show you some pictures here coming up. But the bottom line is it's a much more complex terrain. It's much more difficult to land in that terrain, and there's a lot of hazards. So we developed this system where we're using the radar and we're using cameras to look down and match that terrain with what we've seen from our orbiting spacecraft and look for any hazards and avoid them. And that's exactly what Perseverance did. You heard them talk about terrain relative navigation and the avoidance maneuvers and essentially taking us to a safe location so we didn't end up crashing and landing on a big boulder and tipping over or something like that. So this is a great picture from our orbiting spacecraft. It shows you, you heard the back shell separation, you talked about the parachute, so those landed here. This is that descent stage, which is the rocket stage, which is lowering us down to the ground, uh, crashed off away from the rover. Here's the rover, and here's the heat shield, quite a bit of distance away because we, you know, we separate that pretty early on as we're coming in. So a great picture from orbit, and here's a picture from our helicopter. Uh, so we flew the helicopter about a month ago over uh, the back shell and the parachute. So that's kind of what it looks like when it crashes into Mars. Uh, but it did its job. It protected the rovers that came into the atmosphere. We jettisoned it, and it just goes crashing into the surface. But uh, kind of cool to see that. So Perseverance has been very successful. As I said, it launched last year in February of 2021. So remember, we had to do all this during COVID. And... Uh, obviously very challenging with our team. We never stopped working. We had to put on the safety protocols. And this is a great picture because what it's showing is the no rover's driving itself. This is autonomous driving of the rover. We have to cover a lot of ground with this rover to get to the sample sites that we want to get to. And so we've developed the capacity to, you know, we'll tell the rover, okay, we want you to go to point B way out here. And it can kind of navigate its way and avoid hazards as, it's go as it goes. So it's much more efficient, it's much more quick in terms of our ability to traverse across the, the landscape. Uh, so far we've driven almost five kilometers, so that doesn't sound like much, but remember, we don't drive all that fast. Um, and we want to be very careful with a billion dollar machine on the surface of Mars. But uh, been very successful. Really the key mission for Perseverance is to capture samples that ultimately will come back to Earth. So we have this sample coring drill that takes samples about this size, the size of a small test tube, titanium tube, that we put those samples in, we collect them, we then, then put them back into the rover to store, then we go to the next site and look for another sample that the scientists are very interested in, and this is a constant thing that we're doing day in and day out. So, so far we've found a great place for eight rock cores, so we've taken eight samples, and then we have, we took a sample of the air, if you will, and we have a witness sample. So. That's really been the fundamental mission of what we're trying to do. And actually right now we're looking for a place to take those samples out of the rover and put them on the surface of Mars. You say, why are you doing that? Well, we want to make sure that if something ever happens to the rover, we have some samples that we can go and pick up. So right now, if those samples which are on the inside of the rover got, if we had the robotic little arm that's inside break and we couldn't move them out, we're stuck. We can never get to those samples. So we're going to cache those samples, those eight samples, in a nice flat area where the next mission will come and probably land. So we're, almost, we're guaranteed that there will be at least eight samples for that mission to go pick up and bring back to Earth. And ultimately, you know, we want to collect, we can collect almost 40 samples. We want to collect all of those. But this is kind of our insurance policy to make sure that we have now some samples that can be collected and brought back to Earth. This is a picture from about a week ago of where we are. 
Uh, we've been kind of down in a lower area collecting these eight samples, but now the scientists are wanting to head up into this area, which is kind of that river delta that came out, the river came out and into the crater floor. So that's where they're very excited to look at sediments and take samples there. If you think about Earth, some of the, the um, you know, things that we found from thousands and thousands of years ago were buried in ancient river sediments that have fossilized. So uh, that's really a key target for the scientists. So we're kind of headed up in this direction right now as we speak. And of course, we had a little helicopter that went along for the ride. Uh, this is Ingenuity on its third flight. This was the first time we actually translated the helicopter. The first two flights were just straight up and straight down to prove we could actually fly on Mars. And uh, oops, off the stage. Now it's back. Um, but this was a technology demonstration. You know, we'd never flown on another planet, of course. The Mars atmosphere is only 1% of the Earth's atmosphere, so it's like flying at 100,000 feet with a helicopter. So we just said, can we even do it? And our scientists got together. We have these big thermal vacuum chambers. We tested this thing in, simulating Mars environment. Said, yep, yeah, it can be done. We built this thing. We put it together. We put it on the bottom of the rover. And uh, it came in with the rover. And then once the rover landed, it went looking around for a good flat place. And then the, rover, the helicopter just kind of pops down then drops down to the ground. And so everything has gone great. Uh, we've actually, we're up to 28 flights with the helicopter. Our intent was to fly it five times, and that would prove the technology. So now the scientists are actually using it to look out ahead and scout ahead of the rover. They're using it to go to places where the rover can't go. So it's become a science tool uh, for the science team. So uh, very exciting mission, and uh, great to see all that's going on with the helicopter. And here you go. We're actually up to, as I said, 28 flights now. Um, you can see the distance it's flown. I mean, it's not big. It's about uh, two kilograms. You know, it's not very heavy. It's got some high-definition cameras on it. That's about all it has. But uh, really, we just wanted to prove the concept. And again, um, to Susie's point about temperature, we've had some issues uh, the last week or so where the battery's gotten too cold, and it kind of <clears throat> goes into a safe mode on its own. So we've been communicating with the helicopter. We're saying, OK, because again, it's getting colder on Mars. We're coming into winter. And so we're, we're coming up, the engineers are coming up with ways to kind of turn some things on and off to keep the, get the battery back up to the state of charge we want it in, and then we'll be able to operate again. So we're slowly getting there uh, and bringing it back uh, to operational capability. But these are just things you have to deal with when you're operating on another planet. So moving beyond Mars, um, you may have seen in the video that spacecraft that was kind of spinning by Jupiter. Uh, that was Juno. Uh, that's our mission that's been operating since 2016 around that planet. And we had a mission called Galileo that went there decades ago to explore Jupiter. But it really looked at the moons, looked at the surface of Jupiter. And this mission is designed to really peer below the clouds of Jupiter and understand what's the construction of the, uh, you know, below the surface of the clouds. What are those currents doing? There's bands that go in opposite directions on the planet. It's a weird planet. So uh, what's, the, what's going on with the big red spot? Uh, so very successful in terms of really peering below, using radiometers, using spectrometers, using a lot of different instruments to really map the subsurface of Venus, understand the dynamics of the clouds and the driving forces beneath the clouds. And that's important because Jupiter is obviously the largest planet in the solar system. It was the first planet to form. Uh, it probably allowed life to happen on Earth because it was sucking up all the asteroids and rocks that were flying around the solar system at the time, and they didn't hit the Earth and kind of damage the Earth a lot. So very important for us to understand that planet. So it's been doing great work. Now, an interesting thing about Jupiter, it has this moon called Europa. And Europa is a water moon, an icy moon. So it has an icy surface. This is all ice. But beneath that ice is liquid water. And why does that excite scientists? Because where there's water, liquid water, there could be life. And essentially, uh, there's more water, we believe, on that moon than on the entire planet of Earth. So when you think about all the water that's on the Earth, beneath, the, beneath this moon, which is nowhere near as big as the Earth, there's liquid water more than the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Indian, add it all up, and there's still more water there than here on the Earth. You know, when I was in high school, we thought Earth was the only planet that had water. 
Everything looked dry and dead and cold out there. Now we know that that's not true. And so, again, very exciting. So because it's exciting, we're going to send a mission out there called Europa Clipper. Uh, this is a mission that will basically do flybys of Europa and take a lot of different measurements. It's got an ice penetrating radar. It's got high definition cameras. It's got spectrometers. Uh, a lot of different instruments that will allow us to really understand, OK, what are these weird stripes? What are they made of? What is their chemical composition? How do they get to the surface? How thick is the ice? You know, what's the, what's the water doing beneath the surface? So again, uh, very complex mission. This is the largest spacecraft we've ever built at JPL, probably the most complex spacecraft we've ever built. Uh, it's currently just now in our big clean room getting integrated. All the instruments and components are starting to get integrated on the spacecraft. And ultimately, we'll launch that in uh, late 2024 to head out to uh, Europa. I'll visit, we'll visit Saturn next. Uh, we don't have any current missions around Saturn, but I wanted to talk about Cassini a bit because Cassini uh, did basically 12 years or more around this mission of Saturn or this planet of Saturn. Any of those pictures you see of the incredible rings of Saturn and so on all came from Cassini. Um, but the cool thing was that it discovered the moon of Enceladus has water also. So you think about Europa Clipper or think about Europa, uh, a water moon. Enceladus is also a water moon. And what's interesting here is it has these jets of water that are actually breaking out through these crevasses uh, on the surface of the moon and shooting up into space. And so we literally took Cassini and flew it through one of those jets, navigated about 30 miles above the surface of the moon, and tried to sort out, well, what, what is this water like? What is its contents? Is it like the ocean? Is it fresh? What is it? So, uh, so that's very exciting for the scientists because now you have another water moon where you can actually directly access the water as it blasts out uh, through these crevasses. And so in the United States, we do something called decadal surveys. These is, every 10 years, the scientists get together and talk about what are the important missions for Earth? What are the important missions for planetary? What are the important missions for astrophysics? And the Planetary Decadal Survey just came out about two or three weeks ago. And one of the, one of the top two missions they said you must go do is to go out to Enceladus and try to orbit Enceladus and ultimately land on Enceladus and understand what is this water, how thick is this ice shell, how much water is there beneath the ice. And so we anticipate that this is a mission we'll start developing the technology for here in the next couple of years. And sometime in the 2030s, we'll launch a mission out to Enceladus. Uh, it's called an Orbilander. It's kind of a goofy name, in my opinion. Uh, but ultimately, it orbits. And ultimately, we want to bring it down to the surface with a lander. It's, you know, it's a pretty small moon. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to you know, gently get down to the surface of the moon. That's why you can kind of do this combined mission, orbiting and landing. So uh, another water moon that ultimately we want to go to and ultimately land on. Now we're going to back up from Jupiter and come back to the asteroid belt because we're sending a mission, another mission out to the asteroid belt called Psyche. Why is that important? Well, this is an artist's rendition of what we think Psyche might look like. We don't have any pictures that are nearly this detailed, but we believe that this is a metal asteroid, all metal asteroid. And scientists think that that's actually the core of a planetoid that has been exposed over time by asteroidal bombardment blasting away the soil and the rock to get down to the core. So now we can go out and directly examine a small planet core, if you will, uh, without having to drill through thousands of kilometers of stuff. And so that's why we want to go out to that particular asteroid um, scheduled for launch this year. So this is a picture of the spacecraft in our clean room about three months ago. We since finished all the testing. We've packed it up. We shipped it down to Cape Canaveral about three weeks ago on a C-17. And we're now doing the process down at, processing down at Cape Canaveral for a September launch to send that, send that on its way to the asteroid belt. It also has, you heard Susie talk about laser communication from space. It gives us more bandwidth, more data rate. And so it has a deep space optical communication experiment on that mission. So we're going to try to start communicating from well beyond the Earth out to Mars and beyond with lasers. Uh, we've never done that before, but ultimately we want to be able to do that with many of our spacecraft that are operating in deep space. So we've got two receiver systems, one out in California, what we call Table Mountain, 
also in California at Palomar. So we've now put the equipment in to start being able to actually receive the transmissions from this laser communication device that's on the Psyche spacecraft. So we're excited about that. And then just a brief tour beyond the solar system. Uh, you heard Glenn trying to pronounce nuclear spectroscopic telescope <laughs> array. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's our X-ray telescope that looks into black holes. You can't, you know, there's no light that comes out of black holes. There's no infrared that really comes out of black holes. But there's X-rays that come out of black holes. So this telescope peers inside of black holes. It's been incredibly successful in helping our scientists understand what's going on in a black hole. I talk about this telescope, which is looking for near-Earth objects. It's an infrared telescope that's looking for, you know, rocks and asteroids that may be flying close to the Earth that if they hit us, it could cause pretty cat uh, catastrophic damage. Excuse me. And uh, we have the infra another infrared telescope, Spitzer, which has done great work in terms of it's found some exoplanets. It's really peered deeply into the universe. But the next mission in the infrared is called SphereX. So all of our infrared telescopes to date have kind of been pencil beam telescopes that look at a particular area for a while, and they'll move over here and look at an area, particular targets. But we've never done a survey of the entire sky, the entire universe in the infrared. And you look in the infrared because in the visible, there's a lot of dust out in the galaxies in the universe, and that dust blocks the light. So you can only see so far before the dust accumulates in your sight line, and you can't see any further in the visible. But in the infrared, the dust doesn't really stop the light or the infrared energy. So we can see much further back in time, if you will, in the universe. So uh, we're building this right now. It's, uh, we're working with Caltech to put that together. And every six months, this telescope is going to basically look at the entire universe, the entire sky in the infrared, and start to build this incredible map of the universe in infrared. So another exciting mission. And then the next big telescope you may have read in the paper, we just launched James Webb Space Telescope. It's now fully focused and starting to get operations done. This is called the Roman Space Telescope, which is being built by Goddard Space Flight Center out in Maryland. But the contribution that JPL is making is a coronagraph. And what is a coronagraph? You saw the little, maybe I can back up and run it again. I'll probably mess up the whole system. But uh, a chronograph is a device that goes inside the telescope and it blocks the light of a star. You can see there's the star. And we want to see, we want to block that light. And then we want to be able to see the very dim light of the planets that are orbiting that star. So there's a whole series of things you have to do to do that. It's very complex. But we're building the chronograph at JPL right now. And ultimately, we block that light of the star. We have to refine everything. But at the end of the day, we can now see the reflected light of the planets. And once you can see that light, you can start to do spectroscopy on it. You can break the light down in its different bands. And you can say, OK, here's a nitrogen band. Here's an oxygen band. Here's a methane band. And it starts to tell you a lot about, if I can see this planet, could it be habitable? And if it is habitable, are there signs that life is going on there? Because we know that life causes things like methane and those sorts of things. So uh, we're excited about that. It would be the first time we could ever image a planet around another star and get that type of data. And of course, I don't need to dwell on this. Susie's already covered this very well. And I just, uh, you know, we talked about all the missions that the DSN supports, uh, multiple missions, and not just US missions. Uh, other nations come to us as well. India, United Arab Emirates, Japan. Uh, if they're flying out well beyond the Earth, they look to the Deep Space Network to help provide the support and the data that, that, that they need. And OK, class, test, what is this spacecraft? <laughs> Voyager, right. So, uh, and, and Susie covered this very well. We rely certainly on the, the site here in Canberra to be able to communicate with Voyager 2. And uh, as you know, uh, when Susie talked about the heliopause, getting through that out into you know, interstellar space, uh, Parks really helped us out there. CSIRO really helped us out in terms of making sure we could track that very important time because the scientists want to know exactly, okay, exactly what is happening when we cross that boundary. That's very important knowledge that we want to have. So we wanted to make sure we got all of that data down. So it was a great, great uh, success here in, in Australia. And again, we do a lot of uh, partnership. I just wanted to highlight that we partnership certainly with the DSN. We partnership with CSIRO. We partnership now with the Australian Space Agency 
in a lot of different areas that we're all very interested in. And you see great work, especially with the formation of the Space Agency in Australia uh, for future opportunities for partnership. And upcoming, I think we've talked about several of these. There's uh, the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission. There's the Psyche Mission and the Deep Space Optical Comm. EMIT is an Earth orbiting mission, which will go on the space station. It's actually going to measure the dust that's coming off of Africa every year uh, when they do crops and those sorts of things. But there's this annual cycle where there's a lot of dust that comes off Africa and comes over the North American continent that we really don't understand, but it has a lot of impact on our climate. So that mission will measure what's going on there. And these are just some upcoming missions in 2023. So uh, I know that's a lot, but there is a lot going on. And so, uh, I just wanted to kind of walk you through our universe from the Earth to Mars to the outer planets to beyond the solar system and uh, give you a snapshot of all the science that we're trying to do uh, around those areas. So really appreciate your time and look forward to answering any questions. And Glenn will moderate. I'll invite both of you down to take a seat. I'm going to sit here. Uh, Peter has the microphone, so if you have a question, uh, please put up your hand and get Peter's attention. He'll come to you. And we'll take our first question. Uh, thank you both for those presentations. They were really, really interesting. My question primarily probably doesn't apply to the Voyager missions because it wasn't an issue when they were launched. But how do you mitigate the problem of space junk and no. the risks that they pose? Um, well, there's two things, well, there's a few things, but the first thing is when we launch, we actually do a collision assessment. Uh, it's now a standard practice that when you launch, you don't want to run into anything as you go up, right? Um, and most, you know, the, the space junk, if you will, is pretty much in low Earth orbit. And uh, for, for JPL, once we get through, uh, you know, the big debris field, if you will, uh, we don't have to worry about it if we're around Mars or Jupiter. It's mostly just getting through it at launch. And so there's a whole process that does that assessment. For our Earth orbiting spacecraft, again, there's folks that track all of that. The, uh, the US Air Force does that. Johnson Space Center does that. There's a whole catalog of where all these things are. There's 20 or 30,000 objects. So we know where they are in general, unless you're getting really, really tiny. And it's just a question of avoiding it. And, and so we manage that, but it is a problem because you don't want to continue to increase uh, all of the stuff that's up there. You want to have mitigation or you want to make sure once you launch something, you can either bo boost it up and keep it out of the area where most people are operating or you convert it into the atmosphere. So it's an issue. Uh, people are working on how do you bring all the stuff that's dead out of that orbital area. But for us, we make sure we don't hit it as we go up and we understand where everything is as we operate around the Earth. Thank you very much um, for, for both of the presentations, just wonderful. So w the, the video at the beginning uh, said, uh, one of the things that said, one of the wonderful things about working at JPL, if you have a good idea, you can pursue it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure though that there are probably more good ideas and there are resources available to pursue them. And I imagine the sort of person who has to make decisions about that is probably the chief operating officer. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, how do you prior prioritize those? Yeah, reality, I don't necessarily make all those decisions. Uh, but it, we have processes that allow that to happen. So we try to make it as easy as possible for people to pursue an idea. So for example, if you have an idea, uh, we have a process, you can write a one page proposal. And essentially, you can get about $50,000 to pursue that for a few months and say, OK, is it viable? And then you can say, OK, I think it is. You can submit another level of detail to the proposal and try to get more money. So we try to make it easy to get started in terms of pursuing ideas. And then we have a process where we have our chief scientist, our chief technologist, panels of people, our chief strategy officer, and, and who then step back and look at those things and say, OK, does this fit? I talked about the decadal surveys, right? Does this support a future mission that we might be able to do? Is that mission a priority? Is this going to be a really an enabling technology that allows us to pursue that uh, when nothing else does? So there's really a pretty good process that starts to filter those ideas out as they go further and further along. Because you're right, we can't fund every single thing. So we want to prioritize those things that ultimately will lead to mission success in the future 
and allow us to do things we've not been able to do with the existing technology. So I tell the little story of um, I was walking around the lab one evening and I go down in this lab that's down in a basement. There's two guys down there, two PhDs, and they're just cranking away on this experiment and this lab thing. And I go talk to them and I say, well, sir, this is, you know, we're going to use Cooper electron pairs and quantum, quantum um, you know, uh, sensing, and this will be the most sensitive IR detector ever made in the world. And, you know, they're just loving this stuff. And uh, so we want to make sure that those people have the opportunity to, to take those ideas forward. And maybe it doesn't work, but they're gonna, we're going to allow them to try. But it's the process that we have, I think, that allows those things to happen and I was prioritize. Just, just wondering with the name Sheldon and Let It. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of big bang jokes at the yeah. at the yeah at JPL. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's wherever the mic is will be He's next week. Keep top. your hand up. He's we'll up get to you. Thank you for the presentation. What was your favorite pro project that was launched into well, that was launched into space? I'm going to let Susie answer first. Oh, that's a, that's very easy. Voyager's my favorite project. <laughs> and you know, and, and it's and it's in part because that was the first project I worked on out of college. My, as a young engineer, after I graduated, I, I got a job at JPL and I worked on Voyager um, for the, starting with the Uranus encounter. And I worked on it through Uranus and Neptune. And then I took about 20 years off. And I was asked to come back as a project manager in 2010. And, and it, it's really bookended my career, this incredible mission. And uh, it's just super near and dear to my heart. So that's my favorite mission. Uh, OK, one here in the front. OK, we'll go next. Uh, having spent a large chunk of my career in the manned flight as well as the deep space, I follow with interest what the plans appear to be for Artemis. And I do see mentions of the DSN here and there. I think, uh, is there a, a JPL role uh, in Artemis or not in the man's upcoming manned moon missions or not? Artemis is kind of NASA's mission to go back to the moon ultimately with humans. Um, so we have actually CubeSats that we're going to launch on the Artemis rocket uh, coming up here in, in that phase. Uh, we support some of the NASA centers in terms of understanding the landing and how you do that very well. We don't have a big role on the human side. Again, our focus is robotic space exploration primarily. Uh, but the DSN currently has a role to play because uh, right now they're the ones that would have to communicate with the astronauts as they're orbiting the moon or ultimately are landing on the moon. So. Well, in the near term, yes. Ideally, not in the far term. NASA wants to build a dedicated lunar communication network because the DSN, that's really not its primary job. Its primary job is to communicate with all those robotic spacecraft that are out in deep space. And frankly, when you're talking about humans, they want a lot of communication. They want to be able to reach out and touch the astronauts 24-7, and that's going to suck up a lot of DSN resources. So ideally, we want to move the DSN away from that and allow this separate network to do all the lunar communication. Yeah. OK, there's one here. I don't know who has a mic. Who's got it? OK. We probably have time for only two more questions. OK. He's the killjoy. With all the uh, missions to Mars, and, and we're looking at things that are just like Earth, or trying to, to find things just like Earth, Uranus is so different to every other planet. It is the, the oddball. It's got the weirdest moons. It's got rings that, that don't make sense. We've only had one mission, and my favourite too, <laughs> that's gone there. And it just feels like we're neglecting the, 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 the one planet that is, is the exception, which might actually demonstrate the rule. Well, guess what? You know, I talked about the planetary decadal survey, right? And I said the mission to Enceladus is in the top two. Number one is going back to Uranus. So, uh, so yes, that the decadal survey that just came out said that needs to be the next big mission. So that's what you will see happening is going back there. Uh, so yeah, that will be exciting. Okay. okay I have a question here. Um, I have a question for Susan. When will, what will happen when the Voyagers run out of battery? 
So what happens when they run out of power is we'll no longer be able to communicate with them. They, they, their transmitter won't be sending signals back to us. But they will continue traveling away from us. We just won't be able to hear any signal from them. And essentially, they, they're on escape velocity from us, from our sun. So they go in orbit around the center of our galaxy. And that goal record will stay intact on that spacecraft for millions of years, probably, just orbiting the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Well, I got the last question, just over here. Great talks, thanks. Um, I was wondering, apart from Mars, are there any other sample return missions in the works? I'm sorry, is there what? Any other sample return missions apart from Mars in the works? Um, no, other than the moon, I guess, you know, when we go back to the moon with astronauts, we'll obviously bring more samples back from the moon. But um, there is not, um, you know, it's really hard to bring samples back. I mean, if you wanted to go, number one, Venus, well, there's nothing to land on there. You know, I could, you know, see sampling a comet. Um, you know, there have been missions that have gone out and brought comet samples back. Asteroid samples back. We have our Cyrus Rex that mm -hmm. went out to an asteroid. Mm -hmm. It collected a sample, and it's now coming back with that sample. So there's smaller bodies that we're collecting samples from and bringing them back. But planetary, um, nothing in the works. We've we've looked at going out to the asteroid belt and like uh, Ceres, that largest asteroid which has ice. Can we go there and bring a sample back? But I I would say that's it's still in the mind. It's not yet on the drawing board yet. Uh, but someday we'll do that as well. And that's a, a beautiful point to, to actually end on. There are so many possibilities that are out there and it's the people that uh, Larry's in charge of and Susan's busy managing all these missions every single day and keeping the Deep Space Network in check um, to make sure we can do this. Uh, and all of us do what is basically JPL's motto and that's to dare mighty things, to come up with these grand ideas of exploration something that we all do as human beings every single day. We're natural explorers. We've explored our planet, we're exploring our local neighbourhood, we're exploring the universe around us. And I think tonight's been a wonderful example to hear from two leading figures in that particular area of space exploration. Would you please, big Canberra, thank you to Larry James and Susan Gott. Mm -hmm.